about uh, military vehicles, and we're certainly glad you can join us this evening. Remember, if you have any questions during the presentation, just type them in the chat box, and uh, we'll save some time at the end to get those questions answered. So joining me now from the great state of Texas is the uh, yes, CRF Armed Forces Detachment Unit Leader, John Sprouse, and Maintenance Officer, Paul Kaur. John, Paul, take it away, gentlemen. Hey, welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome to Ground Forces. We are uh, struggling at the moment. <laughs> uh, working on uh, technical difficulties on my end at the same time. Paul, why don't you take off here for a second while I'm typing? I can't yeah, type no at the same time. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, as John Sprouse, he's our, our detachment leader based out of Gainesville. Texas, and I'm Paul Kaur in Frisco, Texas, uh, maintenance officer, and also PIO for for our detachment. Um, we're uh, we're happy that uh, everybody's attending tonight, and we have the opportunity to talk about something other than than airplanes, which is actually a really interesting compliment to to the CAF, uh, as we've seen at events like like Wings Over Dallas. So the Ground Forces Detachment uh, of the CAF, we we're formed specifically around creating a uh, uh, an additional complementary experience, um, specifically around ground vehicles uh, with the, an airfield focus, uh, bringing together living history and uh, other non-flying activities as a part of CAF events and, and it, it exposing the people who come to CAF events to, to a broader experience of what it was like during, during World War II and, and the other uh, periods that we're, we're having events for. Um, especially in others where, where we're trying to do large scale, uh, extremely large scale events that, that involve a lot of different mixed activities. Um, that's, that's originally how we started. Um, we've developed into an organization that essentially has three components to our mission. One is education. First and foremost, uh, what we do, how we do it, and what we deliver is, is geared at educating the general public. A lot of our outreach programs, a lot of the things that we do in in the local community is is focused on school kids there's a uh at least in texas there's a uh, a world war ii component to to high school and we try to give them an exposure to the real equipment uh the uniforms and and things associated with world war ii that they wouldn't normally have access to and it's just part of our outreach mission uh, secondary to that or, or the second component to our our mission is safety uh, essentially working with caf headquarters working with the other units that are out there that have ground forces equipment, whether it be tugs, whether they're bringing in uh, living history vehicles from, say, um, member vehicles into the unit, or they're partnering with uh, Military Vehicle Preservation Association uh, vehicles and, and clubs and organizations to come in. We want to make sure they do that in a, in a safe way, they integrate with the CAF for those events. Excuse me for those events, and also to to use the vehicles and equipment that they have, uh, especially the tugs, forklifts, jeeps, and other you know equipment that they might have around the unit. They're doing it in a safe way. So working with the headquarters, established policy, and entity maintenance, uh, we seem to be the go-to place if if a unit has a jeep or uh, a Dodge weapons carrier truck or something like that, um, somehow they, they always get redirected to us for, hey, what should we be doing from a, a maintenance standpoint? Or, hey, how can we make sure this thing actually stops when we push the brake pedal? I've actually had that question come up. Um, the last thing is the uh, the assistance, uh, just making sure that as we go through and, and learn ways of integrating uh, safety uh, protocols, integrating with the other units, for big events like Wings Over Dallas or uh, events like the, the Dixie Wing Hosts, uh, their annual World War II themed event. Um, we just want to make sure that the policies and lessons learned that come out of the big events that we have get filtered out to or, or disseminated out to the other units so that everybody can learn from the way that we're doing the integration of, of ground forces inside of the larger CAF events. So that's, that's our mission in a nutshell. Paul, uh, be, before you move on to the next slide, just yeah. something that, that occurred to me. I know that, you know, uh, ground vehicles have been a part of CAF uh, for, for many, many years, but not have been in, in more of the, the spotlight than they are now. But how big is the military vehicle movement, not only within CAF, but with uh, outside the CAF? Well, it's 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 huge. Um, and, and, and John, if uh, if you've worked out your 
technical difficulties. He he actually is is yes. way more tightly yes. integrated into that community. Got a little feedback there. Okay, what was your what was the question again, Paul? It was the uh, the extent of the military vehicle, you know, enthusiastic community. You might need to mute one of your speakers there, John. Yep, that might have done it. Did we lose you in the process? No, real. We might have. We'll we'll come yeah. back to that. We'll, we'll, That's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll put that on the question <laughs> list for later on. So I. I yeah, just a, a quick answer. Like I say, John has way more knowledge about that and, and operates in a lot of other circles outside of the CAF as far as military vehicles and and not just the the, the American community, but John's pretty active in the international community, he makes trips over to Europe and works with, uh, with counterparts over there. Um, does vehicle restoration, so he's exposed to a, a lot of a lot of different things. But I will say that there's a lot of interest since we formed the unit a couple of years ago, three years ago. Um, there's been a lot of interest in how to incorporate military vehicles and 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 CIF units um, trying to partner with local military vehicle preservation groups and local living history groups and bring vehicles, bring tents, bring different living history experiences in into the events that they're hosting. Um, the biggest organization worldwide for the military vehicle is MVPA. It's an international organization. It's it's based here in the United States, but they have uh, chapters literally all around the world, Brazil, Turkey, UK, um, Peru, everywhere, basically, Japan. And, uh, and it's a pretty tight-knit community. Um, there's, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of members worldwide that are all active in the uh, in the forums and and have their military vehicles or or like to just follow the military vehicles. So it's a it's a huge community. And there's John on video. This is awesome. We can't hear you, John, but we love your vehicles in the background. Nope, still no. It looks like a Jeep in the background, which is pretty cool. So nope, not hearing you, John. Sorry. <laughs> Is there another microphone button you might be able to use? This is the hazard of swapping out computers right at the last minute. Everything was working great during the during the test. So nope, still no, still no, John. That's all right. Okay, well, I'll just move on then. Um, did, did that answer your question uh, that you had, Steve? Yes, yes, it did. Yep. Okay, all right, cool, thanks. Uh, just to let you know about our, our membership, it's uh, it's made up of CAF members. Uh, first and foremost, any member like any other CAF unit, they have to be a member of, of the CAF as an organization, and then they join the local unit. So we have uh, some of our members belong to just our unit. That's actually the minority of, of members that we have that belong just to the ground forces. Most of the members that we have belong to other units, 30% belong to two CAF units, and we've got 14% that belong to, to three different units. Um, what we found is that um, two things, people are drawn to and, and interested in the, the ground vehicles and the ground equipment and the, and the whole experience beyond the aircraft. It's a way to, to put hands on and get more accessible to, to the living history World War II. Um, as opposed to you know joining a flight crew and and being involved in that often that's that's a little bit distant and 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 they don't have the ability to to do that day in and day out. You can't just go out and buy a p fifty one mustang uh, for the average Joe, you know, the high school teacher or something who wants to do more. so this is this is an alternative for them and and it's pretty exciting because the people who are enthusiastic about military vehicles inside of these these other CAF units, um, often they have relations with people in the MVPA, people in the local chapters, people that have military vehicles, or like uh, Duncan Aaron in, in the UK, he's the new wing leader of one of, our, one of our newest units. He has his own military vehicles and brings them to represent the CAF in, in, inside of his events that he sets up in the, in the UK or participates in. So it's great because it, it builds this, this community of interest and, and expertise within the CAF units, literally worldwide, that allow us to, to share 
you know, stories and, and, and safety things, best practices, and how we can engage with, uh, with our education partners. Do we have a microphone yet, John? Nope, not yet. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Um, membership is open to anybody who's a member of the CAF. They can join the CAF and, and then immediately join or join at the same time through our website uh, to join the ground forces detachment. Membership in the CAF is the only uh, real requirement. Ideally, somebody would be passionate about ground vehicles. But if, if you have uh, somebody out there, maybe you or somebody in your unit that's interested in in the military vehicles or the ground equipment side of, of, of the, the World War II experience or the CAF experience, then by all means, um, go to our website or Facebook page and, and join us because that's, uh, that's the only requirement. Open to everybody. Good. Okay, still no John. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so even though our membership is is relatively small, 24 people that we have in, in formal membership right now, which by the way is in three countries, so we have members in, uh, in in the UK. I mentioned Duncan a little while ago. Uh, most of our members are here in the US and we have uh, a member in Canada also. Um, but our reach is a lot farther than that. I took some quick stats off of Facebook just to show some, some interesting stats. The map shows where the people are that read our Facebook posts. And uh, Facebook is probably the most active social platform. We do have a YouTube channel. We do have a website, but most of the activity is actually on, on Facebook. Um, Obviously, the number one country for our reach is, is the United States, but after that, it's split between fr France and Russia, which is interesting. Um, Moscow, though, is the single city that has the most number of people who are, are following our, our Facebook posts, which I think is kind of cool. And I know that there's a, there's a big military history um, interest there, so it, it, I guess it shouldn't be surprising. It's kind of interesting to just look at the stats and see what the, what the reach is for our activity. So still no John? Okay, all right. It's going to get really fun when we start talking about John's area of expertise, which is the uh, the vehicle part of it. But that's okay. Yeah. Sounds like we got an echo again. Okay, good. So working beyond our detachment, um, we just got a couple more intro slides. This one and and the next one about wings over Dallas. But um, we do have a lot of relationships that go beyond just the CAF. And, and this goes into our, our mission about um, being able to, to integrate with other units and bring a much, much richer experience to, to the CAF, to local units, and, and to the large events like we have, like Wings Over Dallas, Wings Over Houston. Uh, we work with uh, uh, units that are, that are local, units that are national, units that are international, and, and they bring in not just vehicles, but they bring in tents, they bring in living history experience, they bring in uh, international representation, the RAF or you know, other, other units, and uh, it just gives it a much more diverse and, and much more interesting representation of what reality was like during, during uh, a World War II. So a lot of hands-on displays, a lot of the hands-on things come from other organizations who, who we invite and partner with to come into the, uh, the, the events that we're holding. Um, and, and the last thing is, is that we, we also do events and participate in things like, like Veterans Day events, Medal of Honor uh, memorial events, or, or even just local school and, and municipal parades and things like that, community parades. We'll take our vehicles out. Um, one of the vehicles that we're gonna show you today, um, we actually take it out pretty often and just get, get exposure and, and introduce the CAF to a whole new new audience by running a half track in the middle of a parade with all the other veteran and veteran vehicles that are out there. It's pretty exciting. So partnership goes beyond just the CAF individual units that we work with. And I, Very I, much so. How's this working? There you go, John. Welcome. Hey, welcome. Hey. welcome. All right. So the last slide that we have here on the intro before we start diving into our, our individual you know pieces of equipment is uh, is about Wings Over Dallas and. John, this is this is a really good transition for for you to sort of take over and explain, um, you know, all, all the ins and outs, because you were a part of the planning committee for bringing together all these different units and all these different, you know, non CAF organizations to to really enhance Wings Over Dallas. So, and it's it and here. it's a it's a it's like moving an army. It's it's something that starts the day that Wings Over Dallas ends. 
Um, you start recruiting. You start recruiting all all the reenactors. You start putting plans on maps and schedules and pins and dates. And and that's why it was so important that the, the first time they decide when the date is, you know, it's, it, it kills me to wait from October to after ICAS to – everybody decide what the what the, what the airplanes are going to do so we know what to do on the ground because the guys on the ground are planning further out than that um I, maybe one of these days we could get a booth at icas and say hey we're here <laughs> you know we we want to do more um it's the impressions the people the the contacts the just everybody that we've known over the years the people that we meet uh, throughout this process it just it just keeps growing and growing and growing and the phone calls come and it's it's just wonderful it's just it's just keeps moving more and more and more every year it's it's fabulous that the 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 drive and the and the the people that want to be here and want to be a part of the ground side of it and it it's it's just amazing to me how how it's it's taken a life of its own and yeah, for well, folks got... who are not uh, familiar with, with Wings Over Dallas, it's an air show, but not a traditional air show. Uh, you're able to get up much closer to the aircraft than you are at, at many other events. And there, of course, CAF is is part of, of keeping them all flying. So you, you get to see them and smell the, the uh, exhaust and the, you get the little bit of the problems like that. But the, on the ground side, what uh, the ground forces uh, team has been able to put together is an, another interactive, very immersive experience at the bottom of the screen there. You talk about the, the tents and the, the different vehicles and things. And, and the, the, uh, the folks who come to the show just literally walk through the camp and can experience uh, what it was like during World War II. We, we try very hard and it gets better every year to to set up a, a a very good camp where we have the main camp road we have all the different impressions everybody's got their own their own world set up and and some of these guys come in two days in advance and are there the day after tearing down it's it's that big a deal uh, to to set this up and make it it doesn't just show up on Friday morning and pull out a pop-up and here we are you know it, yep. it takes a lot of logistics we're moving a lot of equipment you know 18 wheeled five armored you know 122 different people bringing their own impression uh that's this is just this last you know for 2019 it, it's just it it's it's like moving an army it's it, the logistics in it is, is amazing the immersion uh is is fantastic the people that do that do come and do participate and stay with us and bring their vehicles and uh, do the impressions and do the education programs and talk to the people uh, they they'll be the one they camp right there they love it they there's nothing better than camping under the wing of a b-17 you know they'll tell you that it's basically what you're doing uh, takes them back in time and it takes the everybody that shows up to the event it takes them back in time one of the and that's what really one of the really interesting things that we've been able to do, um, and, and again, this is this is leveraging off of John's connections with the the, the greater community, and bring it in basically live weapons to be able to to shoot off howitzers and and no we're not we're not actually sending projectiles off the airport into into local neighborhoods although some people might we're saving that for 2021 cool. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh, but machine gun displays vehicle mounted uh, machine guns handheld uh, just different weapons uh, even flamethrowers just being able to bring in unique pieces of equipment and and integrate that in as a demonstration so people appreciate you know they see it on tv they see it in movies and old old historical movies and things but to see it live and experience the heat coming off of a, a flamethrower right in front of the, the the stands a safe distance away but still being able to feel it is a completely different experience and it's through the ground forces working with the other units the other organizations in the country that have equipment that we don't have and the expertise the knowledge, and, and in a lot of cases, the licenses, the federal licenses to, to own and operate those pieces of equipment. And then, you know, I talked about the lessons learned 
that we try to share across the organization with our other members to be able to replicate this. One of the things is how do you work with the local airport? How do you work with the police department? How do you check the weapons? And how do you establish the policies? And these are all things that we've had to address to be able to, to bring things in and, and, and have such an immersive, uh, immersive experience at Wings Over Dallas. And that's the kind of thing that when, when we recruit other members from other CAF organizations and they wanna bring that same experience to to their local events you know those are policies and and recommendations and guidelines that we can share with them to say this is how you can do it with your unit join the ground forces and you know we share all this with you and 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 hopefully able to replicate it and of course key part of that is that you know we're going to help support them and and do all that we can to help make that event as successful as possible yeah and safety, if they have, safety, and safety and more safety yep and if we have a cool piece of equipment that they want and they really want it at their air show, even if it's in St. Louis or Atlanta, and uh, they come up with uh, some sponsor money, then we'll be happy to put a half track or something on a on a tractor trailer and take it out there and and have it as a part of their experience. I mean, that's that's part of what we what we want to do for for the other CAF units. Um, kind of like getting the the theater. You just you find a sponsor and you just make it happen. That's what we do. Make it happen. All right. Cool. Well, that's us. That's that's all about the organization and membership and the types of things that we're involved in. Um, I know that, that people are really interested in, in hearing about the equipment. So um, we're going to share with you tonight two pieces of equipment. Both of them are tracked pieces of equipment, and both of them are currently assigned to the ground forces detachment, much like a, an aircraft would be assigned to, to any other CAF unit. We have these assigned to us as as operational artifacts and both of these tracked vehicles are in operating condition, varying degrees of, of restoration, but they do run and we do take them to events and, and actually drive them around so that you can, you can hear it, you can smell it, you can feel it, you can put your hands on it, which is, uh, which is pretty awesome. So the you first one is the, is the Klee track. It's by the Cleveland Tractor Company, which is why we call it a Klee track. And it was purpose built for the US Army Air Corps to be used as a, uh, a tender or a tug for bomber aircraft. That's, that's why it was built. It wasn't taking a civilian tractor and modifying it. It was, it was a purpose-built tractor with all kinds of cool stuff. Um, unique to this particular vehicle, that uh, wasn't PSI air compressor, or the generator, that's a 3KW generator right there on the, uh, on the CLE track. So you can plug in and, and actually do some cool stuff with the aircraft, 10,000 pound winch, because you know, in England, you're flying a bomber, it will get stuck in the mud, it's just a matter of time. So we've got a, a tractor that was designed to to pull it out. So our particular one is, uh, has a, asked John, because he, he was actually instrumental in the, the CAF's acquisition and, uh, and bringing it out and, and doing the restoration of the uh, of the Klee track. Um, it's just a picture here, that's not our Klee track, it's just an example of what a Klee track would do in uh, in the theater, the European theater. But uh, I'll turn it over to John and, and explain to you a little about our Klee track. Our Klee track, of course, manufactured in, in 1943, um, made its way to lend lease to the to the RAF, and it was sold in a in a government auction, just like it happens here in the states. And a gentleman in Belgium purchased it, moved it from England to Belgium, put it in his garage and was with full intention of restoring it because it's such a cool vehicle. He thought so. Well, 35 or eight years later, he still hasn't done it. Um, he had passed away. His son is left with it. The I hear about it, I, of course, hear the story. It's aircraft, it's this, and that's I pitch it to uh, a couple of people, and the next thing I know, I've purchased helped purchase a Klee track in Belgium that was part of the Royal Air Force. The, <laughs> the, the, the long and short of it was, um, you can write a check for anything, but you still got to figure out how to get it moved. It, uh, it it weighs just right at 14,000 pounds sitting there, dead weight, non-running. And with many friends and, many, and uh, contacts I've made over the years, I've got it moved from Belgium 
to H.O. Wildenberg, in, which is in Holland. I don't think he's in Belgium. I think he's in Holland. Oh, and, you're right. Uh, yeah. typo. <laughs> that's the other typo. Um, uh, got H.O. Wildenberg. He put it in a container and shipped it to a another friend of mine at Midwest Military in, in Prior Lake, Minnesota, John Bazal. Uh, he facilitated the the shipping of the vehicle and everything to him. And then uh, I hooked up and and went to Minnesota when as soon as it landed and I was with the truck and trailer and I went to Minnesota and retrieved it and brought it to Texas and started a long restoration process. Uh, it's been a great deal. It's It's been a lot of fun. Uh, as you can see on the back of the of the panels of the seat, it's still, the RAF numbers are still there. The, the, the numbers on the side of the, of the track cover of track fenders, you can see in yellow, that's, their, that's the, the British, uh, yep, they're right there. That's the British numbers, uh, military numbers, like our W -O, our W numbers we used in World War II. That is theirs. Uh, Head was up, cylinder head. You can see the cylinder head was off. He was the gentleman that had started on it. Mess. It was just the oil. Let's see what it sounds like. And the motor is bad. So it just kept getting better. <laughs> uh, it was a fantastic experience. It still has the it, the original tracks are still on it. They're in fantastic shape. I mean, it's 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 a regular little time capsule. It's just as it was issued in '43. All the all the components were there what wasn't there, what had been lost or moved over the years for other vehicles. We ended up <laughs> turning into a clean track salvage yard. I think we're, are we up to nine now, Paul? Uh, uh, I think yeah. Yeah. Cause we had uh, a, a recent one that was a parts one show up. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're up to nine clean track chassis now that we have taken parts off of most of them that this one might've been missing. And, and, I'm, and I'm, when I say parts, as you can look at this one, it's mostly complete, but it's it's the little things, it's the little bracket, it's this thing, it's that. Um, the the unobtainium stuff that you see only in a black and white photo in a, in a book that nobody's ever seen. Uh, we were, uh, there's a 110 volt hand crank, a handheld crank starter for the aircraft engines for when the starters fail that goes with this, that plugs into the generator. Nobody had ever seen one. Uh, by the time the year was up, I've got three in possession. So figure out where they, you know, <laughs> Grandpa's closet had, had has been emptied now. It's we we found all kinds of little treasures, and and the more I find, the more people we meet, the the bigger the stories get, the tales. It's it's amazing. The, the it's it's no different than the Warbird. When when you park a P forty on the tarmac and and the the pilots come out and my grandfather was this or the you hear the stories of my my father was in England and he ran this or we were in UK and it it's an amazing process and I love every day of it it's it really is I wish I could do it for a living but it doesn't pay well <laughs> something that I learned uh, about an hour and a half ago from. John, we were talking about the tracks, and we're going to see another track vehicle, uh, a half track in a minute. But I wanted to call it out in this photo because you can see, I assume that you can see where my mouse is moving. You can see that on the Klee track, there's there's actually a rubber track, and then attached to it are these little pads. And you can see the pads on the track as it's coming out of the container when it arrived in Minnesota. But the uh, the side view, you can actually see the rubber underneath that. And as you know, I, I I served in the army, and you know we had 113s and and, and M60 tanks, and and they had individual little track pieces, and they would break, and you just replace it, and everything would be fine. But in this case, this is a, a continuous track, like a giant rubber band, and and we're going to see some some interesting photos later on of one that broke on our half track. But it, I didn't realize that the the Klee track had basically the same design, which I think is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, they the things were very simple back then. If the design works, just if you need it to be longer, make it longer. Yep. And I'm gonna, um, you know, John, John Shop is the one that was 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 working on this restoration of the Klee track. So I just wanted to point out here a couple of interesting 
photos. One is that, you know, you saw the engine without the head. Well, in, in this case, we actually have a head and he did a fantastic job restoring the engine, getting, getting the engine to work. Um, I'm not sure if that's a Frankenstein engine with parts coming from other places, but um, it it looks, runs, and sounds great now. And uh, we've got videos on our YouTube channel that uh, th that don't make it sound so good. <laughs> I think that's the <laughs> the time where you found out that yeah, that engine's just having some issues. So, uh, yep. but we we've, we've got another photo in here that shows where uh, some some good detail here. You see the red primer on like the pentel hook or or the uh, the sprockets on on the drive chain, the the restoration job like you would do in an airplane, you'd you'd tear it down and you'd take it down to 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 bare metal and rivets. And that's exactly what was done on this particular piece of equipment. Sandblasted everything down, got all the rust off, identified where there might be issues with with the underlying steel, fixed it, and then reprimer the whole thing, then repaint the whole thing just like you would have to do for an aircraft only here we're we're talking about something that weighs you know i, I don't know does it weigh the equivalent of like a, a fighter aircraft or maybe a light bomber or something but it's it's in a very small package so a little bit different but the process is the same and the attention to detail that that was given to this piece of equipment if you're fortunate enough to see it at like wings over dallas or or one of the other events check it out because it it, it really is a fantastic restoration well, thank you. Yeah. And the uh, the last thing is, I know it's a blurry photo. You can see the original video. It's out on our, our website or on our YouTube channel. We'll throw up some links at the end of this presentation. And uh, we'll, we'll actually give them to Steve so that uh, in the follow-up email that goes with this, that, uh, that everybody gets the links to that. Um, once the clee track was restored to operation uh, operational condition and, and 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 there's some things that we still need to continue to 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 add on to replace restore on the clee track but once it was operational it took it down to wings over dallas and uh john being john drove that thing over to fifi whipped out the tow bar and people started panicking inside of the cockpit but once it was connected he started moving that thing and it was pretty exciting so people's eyes were we're buzzing out, but we've got all that on video, so we know that it happened, and we think that it was the first time that that uh, that Klee track had hauled a, a World War II bomber since since the war, probably, and uh, mm -hmm. it was a pretty exciting time for us. Um, we've actually had a lot of comments on our on our Facebook channel that uh, people hadn't seen that before, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Well, the first time they've seen it in color. I found I found a couple of black and white videos from way back when, but. Uh, it was it was a uh, it was very exciting. It was very exciting, and there was a lot of negotiation to do before I could hook up to the <laughs> nose gear of that airplane too. <laughs> cool. We'll have to. Uh... And, and, it, and it pulled it effortlessly. I expected, you know, to to, to, to you know, you know, a B twenty nine is no light aircraft. It's not an L. It's not an L bird. <laughs> and I expected it to lug and maybe load and hard to pull let the clutch out and it just it was at home it just never even knew it was back there hmm. it was amazing i wonder if it would be less work to haul fifi or less work to to convince people to let you haul diamond lil maybe we'll find that out at the next uh, wings over <laughs> dallas we'll we'll have both bombers there and we'll we'll just have to check and see if uh, the clee track can haul diamond lil i think that's a politics thing and not necessarily a can it do it <laughs> Well, it's uh, and it's and the, and that's a, the fun thing about this is that as we continue to grow on the ground force side and and working in you know as a part of the CAF and the 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 ground crews get used to us being around and see that we're not just a fly by the seat of our pants kind of group, um, you know they the, you build that faith and that trust and and training. Of course, there's always training. You you, you know you want to know. This is how we do this. This is what we need to do. And that was the biggest part of, the, of uh, being able to tug Fifi was that we had to prove ourselves that we were good enough to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, let's pivot to our next vehicle. And this is a, a unique piece of equipment, International Harvester 9M1 half track. Uh, it's called a half track, obviously. And it's half wheels, half track. But uh um, thing that makes this one unique, and we'll we'll get into it in just a second. But 
this vehicle shouldn't be in the United States. They they were built under Lynn Lease. They they should have all gone overseas to the European theater and and been delivered to allied nations. But lo and behold, the CAF has a international harvester half track. It's it's kind of unique. Half tracks are all over the place, but this is an international harvester half track, which was only built under a Lynn Lease contract. So a and lot it's of people in the United don't, States. And it's in the US, yeah, exactly. A lot of people don't realize that these are very heavily armored uh, vehicles. So they have the one, you can see it prominently there. It's the one 50 cal machine gun that's sitting on the top and it's 360 degrees. You can actually spin that thing all the way around in, uh, on its, on its uh, little skate. The, uh, the other armament in the back is, is six 30 cal machine guns. The total load of, of ammunition on a typical half track was uh, up to six, typically three. We have three hard mounts. Three hard mounts. Yeah, okay. But up to uh, a little over, or right around 8,500 rounds of, of basic load with uh, with certain configurations of, of these half tracks, which is kind of crazy amount of ammunition. So max speed, 42 miles an hour. We do okay in parades and around the wings over Dallas and, and other events, but uh, we're probably not gonna take this out on the interstate highway. Definitely not gonna run it down the Autobahn. We'd get run over, so yeah. All right, so that's it. That's the the International Harvester Half Track. Um, I did mention Lend Lease. There were three when we started doing our research. Um, there were three International Harvester Half Tracks that were assigned to a U.S. unit that was in the European theater. And the only those International Harvester Half Tracks went to that that unit was they were a uh, an International Harvester company of volunteers who were organized into a single unit, 3rd Maintenance Battalion of the 12th Armored Division. And when they hit the European theater, that, that worked and they were uh, support the 12th Division and they were given um, through the MTO. So you can go, go back and look at the World War II, uh, modified table of organizational equipment, what equipment that unit had, and they actually had three M9A1s assigned to them, one for uh, I think each of the, uh, the companies in the battalion. And it's it's very unique. That's it. Those are the only ones that that we found. All the others, which you can see in the in the photo here during the parade, liberation of Paris, those are M9A1 half tracks that belong to the French Free Forces, and uh, one of the most famous made right here. Um, and and they were they were International Harvester half track. That's why we say it's first in, first in Paris. Yeah, first in Paris. It's really kind of unique that we would have one, and it gives us an opportunity to uh, to not only recognize the efforts of you know, International Harvester and, and their contribution to the connection with our, our, our Lynn Lease um, partners in the Allied Nations in, in, in the war. So, cool. All right. With the fact that I did lose my opinion, I was the only one that voiced it and, and I did not get my way on the paint scheme of this vehicle. <laughs> Can we get it, it could either it could either been French or Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Well, right now it's sort of uh, um, allied nation agnostic, right? Because yeah. we, we have yet to affix the uh, the national identity through the uh, unit markings and such. But It's going uh, to be French. <laughs> good. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so this this particular one, we're looking at pictures that were taken when uh, when the unit uh, originally was assigned this by by the CAF again, like like an aircraft. We are, are are the custodians of this equipment and uh, belongs to CAF. We we are taking care of it. We're restoring it, which is the exact same relationship that you would have with a, a other CAF units that that take um, the responsibility for an aircraft. So there was a lot of work that needed to get done on this particular half track. Um, it has kind of a, a unknown story behind it, but we have it now, and we're we're going to take care of it. And uh, I'm just sort of glossing over. Everybody's laughing now. Yeah. <laughs> um, in in this photo, I wanted to call out some some things are on this slide. So one of the things that make that makes this half track unique, uh, you can see in uh, I assume that you can see my mouse, but in the center photo, we're looking at the rear uh, right corner of the half track, and that's actually curved. So we've got a door in the back, and then the armor, and then it, it curves around to the side, and then it's a straight flat surface that goes all the way down the side towards towards the uh, the, the front cabin area. 
And it's a welded, yeah, it's welded one piece. It's no, it's not bolted. Yeah, if you've seen half tracks at, at other events or in museums around around the US, around the world, you typically see it with bolted arm armor panels and the corner in the back is is very sharp. The International Harvester, the M9A1, this is a, a curve. It's one of the, the easily identifiable attributes, kind of like a P51 has that scoop on the bottom. Well, International Harvester half track has that curved armor and it's a flat side. So we'll see a better picture of that. This is this is the probably so and here we have the detail of the the track. So in the bottom we had to buy a, a new track. We broke the track, the original track that was on it. Well, I don't know that it was original, but the, the track that came with it, um, we had to buy a new one. And we have this photo that shows you the uh, the design of the track. It's kind of unique. I, I didn't realize how a half track track was built until I saw this. And John gave me a little quick lesson on it. Um, can can you tell us what we're looking at here, John? When you, you see it, the, the, the cross section of the track, you can see the, all the little individual holes in the end of that track. All those holes were cabled. And each half track set, each half section of that track, every one of those holes, a cable was laid in, in the crossbars. The crossbars are grooved much like finger grooves you would have, and that crossbar will have that number of slots in it to accommodate the cable. That cable is one piece. It winds, it starts on the inside and winds and winds and winds and keeps going and spaced out until it reaches the outer the outer limits of it. Once the, the with all the crossbars are assembled, bolted together, once all that's done, then it enters the track mold and then they uh, mold and form the rubber around the cables and the crossbars and, at one time. Makes a big, long, endless loop rubber track. That's cool. And it, it, it may not be obvious here because of the, the angle of the photo, but the the slots that we have, you've got, I think, J John, that might be your, your set of hands holding this up, holding a little mm -hmm. screwdriver to show the, the individual cables. But this is this is two halves of the track. And you can see it down here in the bottom photo, the, the I guess, the, the guide. The guide, chain. The guide yeah. chain. Yep, the guide the chain guide in the chain, middle. Yeah. Yes. The guide chain, the sprocket spacing, the, sp uh, the spacing of the cross is 98% the same as the flea track. They used, they found a design that worked. It worked on the clee track. It works on the half track. And it, it didn't take a lot of re-engineering to, to make two different vehicles do the same, the similar different things with the similar system. Awesome. Awesome. So just to to wrap this this up with the with the half track, um, you see uh, a, a lot of the the people working on the half track. We had a a local group that uh, that we partnered with. It's actually a a local high school history club that did a sanctioned event, a field trip that came out. And and again, this is this is part of that work beyond the unit and and seek partnerships in the community. So we partnered with them. They volunteered to come out and work on the half track. They helped us remove the non-original equipment, rotted wood and, and things that needed to come out. Um, fuel tanks, pull out the old fuel tanks so that we could we could get it repaired and, and reworked. Um, they came out and they they came out multiple times and did a bang up job working with us. And uh, and they got credit because they were studying World War II as a part of their their, their course. They got community service hours for through the school, through the sanctioned event. And, and we got basically free labor. More importantly, though, they, they got excited about working on the equipment. And they went back and told their friends. And, and the club grew. And, and they ask us, you know, periodically now, hey, what, what's, what's the next thing? We've had the group come out and, and work on a, a bomb truck. That uh, that we're starting the restoration on, as well as some uh, some work on, on one of the CAF jeeps. So we're uh, we're pretty excited to have that that relationship and, and maybe even expand it uh, a little with other groups. Here's another shot that shows how this is a continuous piece of of rolled steel on the side of that with the with the happy face and all. Um, that, that's how oxidized it was. You can just draw a happy face in the side. Imagine if you let a an aircraft oxidized like that. That wouldn't be good. 
crazy parasitic drag. But uh, but they did a bang up job. And and the key thing is is that the the only way that we can uh, effectively maintain, restore, and, and operate these these pieces of historic equipment is is by having the volunteers, having those partnerships. Um, not just with the volunteers that we have inside of the unit, but the volunteers in, in the greater community who who share the passion and interest, and, and also get some education out of out of some some you know hands-on experience with the with the equipment. So with that, we'll just sort of leave it here with uh, with my daughter screaming and yelling like, "Dad, please don't take the picture." But uh, um, some photos here of the completed M9 M1 half track with uh, with a fresh coat of paint. There's still a lot of work to do on the half track. I'm not even sure that we have the fuel system in place yet. Uh, I think it's just running off of a gas can in the back, but you know, it works. We're not going to, we're not going to tell OSHA about that, but uh, it, it hasn't crashed. It, it hadn't crashed yet. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> well armored. So, and that is the original armor, which makes it very heavy, very sturdy, but uh, you'll see it at wings over Dallas. Uh, we've run it around different parades and, and different things. This is, this is one of our showcase vehicles and we're, we're very proud to have it and really excited that it's a part of the uh, the CAF family. So with that, we wanted to save some time for, for Q&A and sure. see if anybody has any questions out there. Um, yep, yeah, a couple of questions have come in. Um, and and it, I think you've touched on this a little bit. Um, someone out in California is wondering if, if you're going to uh, go out and, and visit the uh, Southern California unit, which is in Camarillo, California. Um, and I think like you said, if you can help We're one check away that there you go <laughs> <laughs> one check away that's that's funny yeah well we'd love to man and i've i've been to that camarillo mm -hmm. unit um a long time ago but i've been out there for a couple of events that they've had um probably when i was still in the carolinas so this is this is going back a long time ago but uh um, they put on a good show out yes. there so we'd yes, love to be do. a part of that absolutely love to be a part of it um we should talk get a hold of go. john or, or me or any of us you know ping us on our website facebook page and just say hey here's what we're thinking here's the event that we're putting together and and and, and let's just start brainstorming it together and if if we're not able to go then uh, we can hook you up with some local organizations that might be able to bring a, a different level of experience too. again through that partnership and outreach beyond the caf Right, and something we had talked about earlier about the fact that this is not just a CAF only thing, although that's what we're spotlighting tonight, but it's also a nationwide, worldwide uh, phenomena of, of restoring uh, military vehicles. Yeah, Very exactly. Much is. Yep. exactly. Uh, me and Paul both are members of the MVPA. Uh, uh, that's worldwide, you know. It's, it, as the Military Vehicle Preservation Association, uh, it just it all kind of blends together it's you know we're we're all we all wear the same green there you go <laughs> um and sean, plug too. there you go sean broadhead uh, is asking uh, um uh, his uncle was uh, in a half track during the battle of the bulge and it wouldn't have been an international uh what would have been the, the half track that that his uncle would have been uh attached to It'd have been an M2 or an M2A1 or even an M3. Uh, they had uh, the M2, the M2A1s, the M3, M3A1s, and I think there were even a few M4s, which was a mortar half track. Uh, depending on what he what his uncle did and everything, okay. you know, we could kind of narrow it down a little bit. But, the manufacturers and, uh, for the other auto car uh, yeah. and and white, they would be the. The builders of the other models of half track. So those are the ones that we're probably the most familiar with uh, being here in the states. Would be the the you said motor car and white, auto car and white. auto car, okay. auto car. Yep, and white motor company. All right. It's funny. Um, all the the auto cars and all the white motor company half tracks all have white motor company engines, transmissions, and power train, you know, rear ends and stuff in them. Uh, white and Autocar were bidding for the for the job, and Autocar got the bid. White delivered the first 60. Okay. Because they had all the powertrains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess that's how we build fighters bit. today, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. Um, and it, I think you've covered most of this, but the, it, the question was the tracks made of steel only, but uh, it, there's the, you mentioned the cables that were in there along with the rubber coating. Yes. Okay. Yep. yep. And that's the only way they came. It's and, something that we talked about early on about those tracks. Um, I, I think it was right before the webinar started. We were just kind of, you know, talking amongst ourselves. Um, the the tracks are still manufactured today. Um, John was sharing a little story about um, he he and some business associates were trying to buy the the track making uh, equipment because it's some pretty specialized equipment and. And today uh, they weren't able to, but today you can still buy tracks that are manufactured. And I think they're they're coming out of Europe, right? Still manufactured yeah, in Europe. Yep. They're well, they're not manufactured in Europe, but they're coming out of Europe. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> so somebody is manufacturing it, but we get them through Europe, which is good yeah. because when we broke our track, it was uh, it was a little bit of a a, a panic moment, but uh, but we did get a, a new manufactured track to put on it. Which is great because it'll last us for for decades. Good, um, and and again we've touched on this a little bit. Uh, do other CAF units have vehicles? And the answer is yes. Most, uh, at least in my recollection, most are going to be jeeps or trucks, where the ground forces detachment has more of the specialized things like the half track, the clee track, the fire truck, uh, fuel tankers, uh, yep. bomb truck. Yep. yep. Cushman scooter, airborne scooter. Yes. We have one of those. We even have a searchlight, which uh, we brought to Wings Over Dallas a couple of years. Yeah, we do, and and we we have on our website, which uh, links on on the uh, on the slide right now, cafgroundforces.org. On our website, we have an equipment page which shows an inventory of all the different equipment that we have. Uh, there's a lot of unique pieces that are out there, and uh, most of them have a really interesting history associated with them. We even have a uh, I think it's an M1 120 millimeter anti-aircraft gun that uh, that would typically be out there, you know, defending an airfield during World War II. It was it was a, it was actually it's a stratosphere gun. It was a coastal it was coastal defense World War II, and it was strictly used on the U.S. shores. So wow. it would have been cool. anywhere wow. along coastal defense, looking for Germans. Amazing. So we have some odd stuff. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, the member is asking, uh, they're actually in central Arkansas. How can they get involved with uh, ground forces? I mean, it's not obviously not uh, practical to drive to maybe help out uh, on a weekly or even monthly basis, but but how can they support that, uh, the uh, ground forces? Well, it it's open to any CAF member that, that wants to join the unit. You can join our unit just like you, you could join any other unit and actually it's probably similar to to, to joining the b29 b24 squadron in that um you know they, they would go around and do the tour but most people wouldn't actually go to dallas where where the aircraft are based and and work with them on a daily basis so it's kind of the same thing what what we'd like to do is is have members in, in other units that are out there central arkansas would be fantastic um what we could do is is when there's events, make sure that that the person is is well informed of what capabilities there are. If uh, if there's interest in bringing equipment, obviously we could help facilitate that, and it'd be great to have boots on the ground, member of of another unit to be able to facilitate that that conversation. But you know, e equally, just being able to have somebody uh, become aware of all, all the different opportunities that are in in their area that they might not otherwise be aware of now like the the network the extensive network of other units other living history other organizations that uh, that might be operating in the area make that connection for them and and again just grow the the, the community of interest and bring that community into to the benefit of the caf and other other caf units so yeah we welcome the membership from everybody the way that you connect up with us is through our facebook page or through our website um, or or just send us an email info at cafgroundforces.org but you, you can join the unit online it's uh it's pretty easy to do um it's pretty cheap i, I think our membership is we're still 30 dollars a year right for for the it's unit 30 or 300 i can't remember <laughs> yeah just send a big check we'll we'll write in a number um there you go 
<laughs> but you can join right online, right, right through our website if uh, if you're so inclined. It'd be great. All right. And and speaking of the website, you also have a PX on the website. I see, uh, John, you've got your uh, Ground Forces uh, logoed shirt on. Uh, you can you can buy that on the website. I would assume, right? Yeah, absolutely. Put, yep. Put right. Shameless plug. Yep. You can even sponsor a yeah. vehicle if you wanted to do that through the website. Speaking of the other vehicles, what's next on? the uh, the agenda i know there's there's work still to do on the clee track and the half track but what's the next big project so the next big project we're working on is the m27 bomb truck okay. um due to covid19 that has pushed itself out a little bit longer than normal <laughs> I, I got used to that quote from many shipping to yes. department and everything <laughs> else over the years uh, uh, yeah. Um, we got a good start on it. We were, we've taken the hoist off. We've done a few things to it. It, uh, it actually runs and drives. So mechanically engine and transmission is good shape is decent shape. You know, it needs service, but that's no big deal. Um, we had started taking the hoist off because the, the wood in the bed was in bad shape. Whereas, uh, getting forward, moving on that, we got the, I think we got the bed off of it. Um, really moving into it. And then in everybody's world came yeah. to an end. Yep. yep. And for those who are not familiar with the bomb truck, what what exactly does it look like? What's the chassis uh, based on? It's a it's a CCKW two and a half ton GMC um, has a hoist in the back that with a dual set of winches that can actually lift bombs off the tra off of trailers and trolley them into the bed they stage them in the bed they haul them out to the airfield uh or down the road usually from the ammo depot they'll go out to the airfield then they pick them back up off the truck set them on the little bomb cart trailers that you've probably seen the tugs and the stuff in the pictures they wheel around like luggage carts at an airport and they'll each individual aircraft will get whatever ordinance it needs and from that bomb cart and then move on from there and the truck goes back and forth from the from the ammo depot to the airfield. Okay. And with the uh, just a couple of minutes left, uh, any final thoughts from uh, both of you, uh, Paul? It's it's exciting, and it, it it's it's a fun unit. We're a, a small, tight knit group. I mean, we've got members literally halfway around the world, and uh, and it's great because we can communicate and collaborate uh, with, with a, a great diversity of people who are sharing a passion for the military vehicles and, and, and creating living history experience. And it's fun. I've been in the CAF for a long time, but this is, this is a very different experience from an aircraft unit. And, and it's a lot of fun to, to be a part of this. It, it really is. It's, it's been a pleasure to, to, to lead this from conception. Um, it, the people, I said, it, it all goes back to the people. The people are wonderful. The people are what's make everything. And and as the years progress, the, the, the more people we meet, the the better it gets. And I, I really, it's fun. All right. And we, and we like to make the airplanes look good. I mean, that's there what we do. <laughs> that's yeah. true. That's true. <laughs> well, if, if you'd like more information about the ground forces, uh, we've got the uh, the uh, links right there for the uh, web page, the Facebook page, YouTube. Uh, we'll also send those links out with the follow up email. And uh, just uh, with the moments we have, just want to thank you, uh, Paul, maintenance officer and uh, John, the uh, unit leader from the ground forces detachment. You guys are doing a great job and uh, look forward to seeing you at an air show sometime down the road this year. We certainly hope so. All right. Have a great evening, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you.